Welcome to the Synthesis of Yoga podcast. We are on the 14th episode, third chapter, 11th paragraph. The description below will have the link to this particular chapter and I highly recommend you to have a copy of the book so that we can travel together with the text because immersion in these lines is what will really imprint Sri Aurobindo's vision, the clarity of seeing and that consciousness into us. So please do keep the book with you so that uh, we can keep up with the lines that I am reading and immerse in it. So in the previous episode we have touched upon We have covered this whole aspect of the material man who has this conservative tendency serving that function of conserving and preserving the gains of the past, but in the process become incapable of opening to the new progressive mind and its ideas. It is the first born stage. The material life, the bodily life, its conservative inertia. And Sri Aurobindo will be continuing elaborating on this particular theme further in this episode. Let's read the 11th paragraph. Yet he admits so much of spirituality as has been enforced on his customary ideas by the great religious outbursts of the past and he makes in his scheme of society, a place, venerable, though not often effective, for the priest or the learned theologian, who can be trusted to provide him with a safe and ordinary spiritual pabulum. So he here is this conservative man, the firstborn, living the material life. He admits so much of spirituality as has been enforced on his customary ideas by the great religious outbursts of the past. So historically, there had always been outbursts of spiritual forces in the society or progressive minds breaking out from the customary ideas. So the great religious outbursts of the past, these outbursts enforce on his customary ideas, new possibilities, and he makes in his scheme of society a place venerable, though not often effective. So the customary man knows this is there and it has to be given a place. So he provides a scheme in the society, a place, a venerable, though not often effective, for the priest or the learned theologian. So the conservative people who preserve the tradition, they have this priests or the learned theologians who interpret for them the great teachings of the past and keep them along going. So that's what they can accept and allow in a conservative society. Priest or the learned theologian who can be trusted to provide him with a safe and ordinary spiritual pabulum. Pabulum is this bland, uh, we can say in this context, the bland teaching that really doesn't disturb him. But here is a priest or a pundit giving the explanation of things so that it doesn't disturb, yet it explains. The possibility of the path ahead is given an insight through the ritual, ceremonies, teachings, all that. But yet it is still happening within the conservative mold. So the scheme has provision for such members in the society as pundits, as priests, So, yet he admits so much of spirituality as has been enforced on his customary ideas by the great religious outbursts of the past and he makes in his scheme of society a place 
venerable though not effective for the priest or the learned theologian who can be trusted to provide him with a safe and ordinary spiritual pabulum. Safe and ordinary spiritual pabulum. Spirituality is all fine. Progress is all fine. As long as it doesn't disturb my family order, my social order. As long as that is protected, everything is fine. So it has to be a safe and ordinary spiritual pabulum. No radical teachings, that's not okay. It has to be within that safe limits. That's what the conservative man would accept the conservative teachers who preserves, who looks like progressives, but are not actually progressives. But to the man who would assert for himself the liberty of spiritual experience and the spiritual life, he assigns, if he admits him at all, not the vestment of the priest, but the robe of the sannyasin. So here, Sri Aurobindo is elaborating further on the Indian notions, where this whole idea of Dvija, the twice born, is already there. And the conservative man accept the pandit, the priest, all that. But when someone actually enters the spiritual path and immerse in the experience and assert himself from that strength, such person is a danger to the society. So what does the conservative man do? Give him the robe of the sannyasin. Don't disturb the social order. Get out of it. So that had been the custom in India. If you are a seeker, you renounce the customary traditional institutions that are very, very conservative. You get out of it, wear the robe of the sannyasin, and that is socially accepted. And you will be respected, worshipped for all that is fine, as long as you don't disturb the social order. Whatever progress you want to make, make it outside the social order, existing conservative institutions. So, to the man who would assert himself the liberty of spiritual experience and spiritual life, he assigns, he is the conservative man, the conservative society, he assigns, if he admits him at all, <laughs> first of all, admitting such a person is a danger. If at all such a person is admitted, then you have to have the investment of the priest, not the vestment of the priest, but the robe of the sannyasin. A priest is still protecting the conservative institutions of the past, whereas a sannyasin, a true sannyasin, who is into the spiritual experience and that journey, who is a danger. So you need to be kept separate, given a separate robe. You step out of it. So the robe of the sannyasin. Outside society, let him exercise his dangerous freedom. That's okay. Outside society, you exercise whatsoever be the liberty, freedom of experimentation, exploration, whatsoever you want to do, do it outside. Don't disturb the social order, existing social order to be preserved, protected. Priests are fine. Pandits are fine, but not this dangerous sannyasins who are immersing in experience and bringing in new possibilities. So they are to be kept out. So he may even serve as a human lightning road, receiving the electricity of the spirit and turning it away from the social edifice. Beautiful image. This sannyasin, who is the dangerous man, I'm here talking about the real sannyasins, not those who are just wearing the saffron cloth and going around, but the seekers of a spiritual experience. That's what that symbol essentially represented in the past. Now that itself has become a custom, a tradition, a customary robe. 
and the truly uh, a true seeker is a dangerous man so he may even serve as a human lightning rod receiving the electricity of the spirit receiving the electricity of the spirit lightning rod like in the buildings we have the lightning rod protection rod that takes the current and earth it so that the building remains safe so that's the kind of function this dangerous man who is progressive is serving and he is kept outside the society so he acts like a lightning rod through which the currents of the spirit the dangerous powerful intensities of the spirit can flow down and earth into uh, the society so it will protect the social edifice it will not destroy the social structure that's a kind of framework india developed over centuries to protect the social order those who are too dangerous seekers be outside and exercise your freedom outside or act like a lightning rod who is receiving and that imagery is very important in integral yoga because later you will learn that this there is a descending light and force from above a immense spiritual force that descends from above that's part of the process of spiritual transformation so it's not just a metaphor there is a deeper truth behind it he may even serve as a human lightning rod receiving the electricity of the spirit and turning it away from the social edifice so that the social order is protected this person is bringing in spiritual experience into himself without disturbing the rest nevertheless it is possible to make the material man and his spiritual and his life moderately progressive by imprinting on the material mind the custom of progress the habit of conscious change the fixed idea of progression as a law of life so even if this conservative instinct and inertia preservative nature is there in this material man it is still possible to make this material man moderately progressive it is still a moderate progressiveness that such conservative inertia would allow and it can be done by imprinting on material mind the material mind the very brain is our material organ through which my, the mind is expressing itself and the whole nervous system imprinting in the on the material mind the custom of progress the habit of conscious change the fixed idea of progression as law of life now in a modern society this is now rapidly happening because there is this widespread action of the progressive mind upon the conservative societies across the world and this progressive mind has imprinted in the conservative society the idea of constant conscious change and progress and how is it happening take for example you keep upgrading your mobile phone for better technologies you are keeping up with fashion trends you are keeping up with all the news and the new things that are constantly being produced in the society so the whole idea of upgrading yourself is now imprinted in the conservative man at a wide scale technology is playing a major role in establishing that progressive impulse even if it is a moderate progression progression that can be imprinted but in the material mind that is possible to imprint and it is in the modern time it is we can very visibly see this imprint is now widespread in the even in the material man the sense of progress is economic growth 
has become a watchword. You have to become richer and richer and richer. It's not enough to be satisfied with your existing round of income. You need to go on growing, expanding. That has become the watchword in the social order, increasingly being driven by the progressive mind. So nevertheless, it is possible to make the material man and his life more directly progressive by imprinting on the material mind the custom of progress, the habit of conscious change, the fixed idea of progression as a law of life. So even if there is this massive consumerism thriving behind it, on one side it is destroying the natural resources, on the other side, it is pulling the masses out of the conservative inertia into this upgradation of their clothing and their gadgets and everything. A sense of change, a sense of progress, slowly getting imprinted. That's happening. The creation by this means of progressive societies in Europe is one of the greatest triumphs of mind over matter. So this trend began in Europe in the present cycle of civilization. The progressive mind emerged in Europe. From there it has spread across the world. He's writing this 100 years ago, where Europe was still the leading figure. The creation of this means of progressive society, creation of Creation by this means of progressive societies in Europe is one of the greatest triumphs of mind over matter. So the progressive mind had its triumph over matter. There is this mastery of material forces. Out of that comes our technologies and there is a constant evolution of technologies pushing the boundaries, now accelerating that process. And societies became progressive the conservative societies became increasingly progressive by taking on that impulse. And now that is spreading across the planet and becoming much more rapid. But the physical nature has its revenge for the progress made tends to be of the grosser and more outward kind. And its attempt at a higher and more rapid movement bring about great weariness, sift exhaustions, and startling recoils. Such a visionary line that he's writing 100 years ago. To the physical nature in which mind is bringing in this progressive impulsion, and mastering matter itself, and even making a society progressive. But physical nature, that is the first layer of the nature, the conservative instinctual part of the nature. The physical nature has its revenge for the progress made. For the progress made tends to be of the grosser and more outward kind. That we can see everywhere. The progress, what we call progress is essentially material level progress. Even when we refer to developed nations, we are talking about materially developed nations, outwardly developed nations, not necessarily spiritually developed nations. That vocabulary still doesn't exist. What it means to have a spiritually developed nation. We have materially developed nations. And these are outward progress made, grosser kind of progress. So the progress made tends to be of the grosser and more outward kind. And its attempt at a higher or more rapid movement, higher or rapid movement, bring about great weariness, swift, swift exhaustions or startling recoils. So when this progressive movement try to go fast, make it rapid, or try to reach something higher, with it comes the great weariness, swift exhaustions, startling recoils. So we can see in Europe there is a great weariness, that cycle of 
progressive mind striving to reach beyond itself, tiring out itself, getting tired and slowing down, slowing down, slowing down. There is a weariness that is settling. People feeling increasingly empty in life. There is tremendous material progress made and yet one feel exhausted, inwardly empty. So we have nations where depression, loneliness, developed, so-called developed nations, materially developed nations, having this weariness, exhaustion, inner emptiness, and then startling recoils. So then people revolt against technology, revolt against modernism, and try to go back to the past, into the romantic ideals of the village life, anti-technology, anti-establishment, anti, 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 everything anti. And we can see even when the first wave of spiritual waves shook, uh, spread across the world, the whole hippie movement went with the wave and rejected the modernity and its technology and everything, went back into the natural instinct, it fell back into the natural instincts, animal instincts, they fell back into that. And with it comes its swift exhaustions, weariness, startling recoils. This is, way, this is the way the nature takes her revenge, the physical nature. When a group of people try to go beyond the physical nature, then the other part, the conservative part, takes its revenge by bringing in this great weariness, exhaustion, and even recoil. And we can see even in the modern world with this rapid growth of mental development through social media, it is creating such an exhaustion in people, tiredness with this pounding of information from all sides and endless consumption, the doom scroll of the modern media, you know, the social media feeds where reels are consumed endlessly and there is this exhaustion, weariness and breaking down of the mind itself taking place and many people recoil from it. So all that is part of this nature's grand work that is unfolding through this progress of collective. The progressive mind brings in this moderate sense of progress into the conservative society, but again, there is this price to be paid. There is an exhaustion, weariness, or that happens. Let's move on. It is possible also to give the material man and his life a moderate spirituality by accustoming him to regard in a religious spirit or the institutions of life and its customary activities. So the material man, the material life has other two tires above. One is the progressive mind, other is the spiritual. So we can see the progressive mind can imprint a moderate sense of progress. Similarly, the spiritual dimension can imprint a moderate spirituality. It is possible also to give the material man and his life a moderate spirituality by accustoming him to regard in a religious spirit all the institutions of life and its customary activities. So that's a possibility. All the institutions of life can be given an imprint of a spiritual perspective. The creation of such spiritualized communities in the East has been one of the greatest triumphs of spirit over matter. So here is the triumph of spirit over matter. Other one is triumph of mind over matter. So in the East, it had been the triumph of spirit over matter and the conservative inertia, conservative society. In the West, in this last cycle, it had been the mind over matter. So the creation of such spiritualized communities in the East has been one of the greatest triumphs of spirit over matter. 
yet here too there is a defect. For this often tends only to the creation of a religious temperament, the most outward form of spirituality. In India, we can see this widespread religious temperament. This religious temperament is created by those seekers who arrived at spiritual realization. They brought in an imprint into the collectivity, into its customer institutions, and brought in that imprint of spiritual perspective, but it is conserved as a religious temperament, the most outward form of spirituality. So in everywhere in India, you will find all these thousands and thousands of temples and rituals and worships and devotion. The recognition of the spiritual is everywhere in India. But it is still happening within the conservative mold of the past. It's very important to recognize there is a devotion, even devotion to many of the progressive masters of modern time, but still it remains as a religious devotional temperament. It doesn't necessarily fundamentally change the person or a group because it's still a very moderate spirituality. You happily do the rituals, ceremonies. You have deep faith in the divine grace, divine protection, but your life continues in the very same old mode of a conservative society. You are still not able to pull out and enter into the second stage of whether it is progressive mind or the third birth into the spirit. Both mind and spirit can leave its imprint into the material man. And the spirit leaves its imprint and that's where the religious temperament become widespread, an outward form of spirituality. There is an acknowledgement, there is a worship, there is no fundamental change. Its higher manifestations, even the most, most splendid and puissant, either merely increase the number of souls drawn out of social life and so impoverish it or disturb the society for a while by a momentary elevation. So we can see great masters coming and having a vast movement. And that vast movement draws large number of individuals into its orbit. Since India has this traditional custom of renunciation and becoming a sannyasin or monk, you leave the society. So it impoverishes the society. And this movement of a new wave of awakening through a new awakened master, it gives a momentary elevation. But then after that, once the master leaves, it will fall back into conservative inertia. And that's had been the cycles in India. We can see everywhere in India that. Its higher manifestations, even the most splendid and puissant, even those powerful movements, either merely increase the number of souls drawn out of social life. So hundreds and thousands of people go and join these movements, drawn out of social life, and so impoverish it when finest minds leave the society, the society is impoverished or disturb the society for a while by a momentary elevation. So there is a wave of spiritual awakening for a moment passing through the society, it disturbs the society, but it is momentary, it doesn't last, it's not permanent and that's the challenge. The truth is that neither the mental effort nor the spiritual impulse can suffice. Divorced from each other, 
to overcome the immense resistance of material nature. Here Sri Aurobindo is bringing in a very crucial point. The truth is that neither mental effort nor the spiritual impulse can suffice. Divorce from each other, that's the key. When the spiritual effort and the mental effort are divorced from each other. We can see it in modern society. Scientific mind represents the progressive mind. The spiritual seekers represents the spiritual impulse. When these two are divorced from each other, by themselves, it is not enough to take the society into a higher possibility. Neither spiritual impulse can lift the society, nor the progressive mind can lift the society. It is only when they come together. Neither the mental effort nor the spiritual impulse can suffice. Divorce from each other to overcome the immense resistance of material nature. Material nature provides an immense resistance. It has the conservative inertia. So the bodily life is bound by that inertia. And there is no way to lift up a collective life when these two immense powers act separately. She demands their alliance in a complete effort before she will, she will suffer a complete change in humanity. She, nature, demands their alliance. So we can see in India, there was a spiritual impulse that went and created tremendous spiritual movements, traditions, various customary institutions, schools, all that. And in the West, we can see the progressive mind creating its own institutions. And nature is demanding their alliance in a complete effort before she will suffer a complete change in humanity. So the recoils of nature is also to ensure that everything is taken and synthesized and brought forth together to make a complete change in humanity. So she demands their alliance in a complete effort before she will suffer a complete change in humanity. But usually, these two great agents are unwilling to make to each other the necessary concessions. Now, this is the ongoing issue in the world. How to bring together the progressive mind and the spiritual impulse together. We have the model of knowledge of the science and there is another model of knowledge of spirituality. And we can see across the world more and more scientists are turning towards meditation and inner practices and spiritual teachers are also opening to the scientific inquiries and social development. And more and more dialogues are happening but a shared vision, a shared knowledge body shared model of understanding is yet to emerge. That's a work in progress. Usually these two great agents are unwilling to make to each other the necessary concessions. Necessary concessions. Sri Aurobindo is writing this 100 years ago. Let's remember that. At that time, it was, it did not have what is happening today. Today there is a lot more dialogue between these two major impulses in society, a conscious recognition of their value. So that's an ongoing process of synthesis, a greater synthesis of it. And uh, it's a work that is happening. And in Sri work, we can see the place of the progressive mind, the spiritual impulse, all that put together in a grand synthesis. Everything has its place. And when they come together, there is a powerful transformation at a large scale on a collective level. So with that, we come to the end of this episode. Please give me your feedback, your suggestions. Looking forward to it. And please do subscribe to this channel so that you can get the notifications. Don't forget to click the bell icon so that you get the notification whenever a new episode is posted. Every Wednesday, 6 a.m. 
new episode comes. Let's enjoy. Thank you.